Welcome to the Spot Robotics Podcast. Today I'm joined with my guest, Mr. Shasha Kaplan, and we discuss college admissions and how to be competitive in the job market and get jobs at Toyota and JP Morgan. I hope you enjoy this podcast where you can gain insights into the developments of technology in the modern world and gain a new perspective and advice on how to succeed in these fields. If you enjoyed the podcast, make sure to give us a follow on where you get your podcast. And you, even if you would like to support us even more, make sure to give us a review. Thank you and enjoy. So for my first question, I basically want to ask, like, so you basically currently are working on like a Toyota One Tech co-op. So I want to ask, like, what your responsibilities and like what the work you do and basically how you kind of got that like experience in like college. Sure. Uh, so yeah, um, I currently work at uh, Toyota North America and their Plano headquarters. Uh, working in one tech, which is like one of the bigger divisions. Uh, unfortunately, I don't get to work on any of the cool stuff when it comes to like how the cars work or like autonomous driving or anything like that. I'm not going to lie. I kind of wished I did, but oh, well, maybe uh, my next rotation in the program. But um, I work in the ServiceNow or IT service management space. So ServiceNow is like a giant IT service management platform, and it's used a lot for like streamlining a lot of um, tasks and such. And so, you know, as an intern um, or as a co-op, you know, it's anonymous. Um, I get to help out Toyota with a lot of the processes and stuff in the service now space. And it's kind of used for a lot of things, especially in terms of like HR, right? So let's say, you know, you interview someone and they get the job. Then there's like this whole like process that needs to go down through service now to set up that person's account in the Toyota system, issue them a Toyota laptop, and you know make sure that they are like properly implemented within like everything with Toyota HR. Um, and so I'm getting to work a little bit on that and like that whole system and how all that stuff works. And some of the other responsibilities is just like data migration from older to newer systems and making sure that all the processes work in the way that we want them to to you know maximize efficiency. You know, as for how I got into that whole position, um, I was really looking for a job my um, my last semester. I mean, I already had an internship lined up with another company, and I was like, well, I kind of need to pay for school because um, mm-hmm. school is pretty expensive. And um, I was at my research lab, and I had a buddy who loves to do research in autonomous driving. Um and he's, uh, we share the lab space with another lab and that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to build a robot that can do like autonomous driving and autonomous tasks. Um, and he was like, yeah, I used to work at Toyota um, and they're a really great place to work during the school year. Why don't I see what I can do to, you know, get you in? So he gave me the contact information for the recruiter. Um, I reached out. She said, are you willing to take a semester off from school? I said, sure, knowing that I really wasn't. Um, and they gave me the interview and I guess I did well enough for them to give me a job. So... Uh, you know, after that, I told them, hey, I kind of still want to keep on going to school. And they're really flexible about that. And, uh, you know, now the rest is history. That's, that's really interesting. That's, uh, so my next question was, you talk about like research. So I want to basically ask about like, how, what type of research you do at UTG? And again, how, how did you get into research? What made you interested in to go to research in particular? Sure. You know, I, I think I'm going in a little bit more of an unorthodox approach, um, like as an undergraduate, because I am doing it for credit, right? Um, a lot of students um, in UTD have to take so many hours or so many classes of like, like electives within the umbrella of computer science. So um, I think it's like three to four classes that you'd have to take. And some people might want to go into like taking artificial intelligence classes. Some people want to go into cybersecurity classes. Um, and I didn't meet any of the prerequisites for any of those courses, and I'm trying to graduate a year early. Um, so I went through this huge list of all the classes that you can take that counts for that specific credit, and I saw like at the very bottom of the sheet with a little asterisk, um, undergraduate research, and I was curious about it, and it required reaching out to the head of the computer science program and getting approval from your advisor. They both, for some reason, said yes. Um, and then after that, I, I started the program with them, went to a research seminar on Friday nights with the head of the computer science department, Dr. Uh, Ovi Dutaescu. And uh, he kind of sent out a little questionnaire to everyone asking us in our in- about our interests. And I said that I'd love to get to do research in like music and sound separation. I'm a musician. I love learning about music, practicing it, playing it. 
Um, and so he paired me with Dr. Yaping Tian and his lab, which is the computer vision and multimodal computing lab. And they aim to fix and solve problems in you know, the computer science space using multimodal computing. Now, what that means, right, is if you have, you know, your basic AI model, and I mean, I say basic, it, it really isn't, you know, but um, one that is of, a, of one particular modality, right? So let's say you're only training a computer vision model. That means you're only giving it visual information, so just pictures. What our lab tries to do is uh, we are trying to see how much better and how much more efficient we can make a model if we give it multiple senses or multiple modalities. So my project specifically has to do with using artificial intelligence to help screen for autism spectrum disorder. And we're giving our model videos with um, speech, um, audio, and, um, you know, of course, the, the visuals from the video itself. And we're feeding this into a model. And then based off of, you know, reviews from lots of people in the um, autism space, particularly the Callier Center and the Autism Treatment Center of Dallas, um, and, you know, other, you know, major academic sources like different screening and diagnosis tools and uh, the DSM-5, you know, we created this model that can look at these videos and can say, which particular autism traits, you know, can we pick up and that we can screen for? And then, oh, is this activity neurotypical or neurodivergent? And it's been really, really cool. And I mean, especially because, you know, with this kind of, with this kind of research, we can hopefully make, you know, healthcare much more accessible, which is one of the things that Dr. Tien is just all about. And to get to be a part of that is just really, really That's, cool. that's really interesting. That's, uh, so for my next question, you, um, basically you said that you had like, software engineering, like an internship at JP Morgan. So I was, I was also curious to ask like what you did, what you, what did you gain from that experience? And again, like, how did you basically get that, like, like a research, like an internship at, in like university? Right. Uh, so like most of my other job experiences, a lot of it was like, I kind of knew someone and I was in the right place at the right time. Um, when I was in high school, we're bringing it all the way back there. I used to work at a local rec center and I used to be a lifeguard, and a swimming instructor. And like, I worked the front desk. I, I kind of like, like hopped around in that rec center and I knew a bunch of people. And there was this one person I used to work with and she and I both were lifeguards together and we both swam on the swim team. Uh, one day I was at an event at UTD. I think it was a comedian who came by and I randomly bumped into her and I was like, Hey, how are you? And we started talking. And I was like, oh, yeah, how's your chemistry degree going? I remember you said you're trying to transfer to another university to switch to chemical engineering. And she said, no, actually, I'm in computer science and I work for JP Morgan. And I was like, no kidding. I applied to JP Morgan, but they never got back to me. And she was like, oh, really? Here's the contact information for the recruiter. Uh, tell them I saw you. So I you know, reached out and said, hey, my friend Diana told me to reach out to you. Um, please give me a job, please. And... <laughs> I mean, I'm kidding, but I did say like, Hey, you know, they reached out, like, um, I'm really interested in the company, you know, can we maybe get a, a phone call going to discuss a little bit more about what the program entails and like, you know, I, I'm really interested. And so the recruiter, you know, kind of gave me a shot. Um, I already did the first, I'd already applied like maybe a month prior and did their first phase of the interview, which is like a coding assessment and I didn't do the best on it, but I didn't automatically get rejected. So I guess I did something right. And, you know, when I was on the phone with him, we spoke, he kind of gave me a bit of a screening of like, okay, are you a match for the program or not? And he said, you'll find out in one or two weeks, whether or not you get an interview. Three weeks later, he sends me an email Wednesday night saying, hey, you're invited to a hackathon on Friday night called Code for Good. Uh, show up, please, with a smiley face. And I was like, what is this? Is this just a networking event? And he said, no, this is your interview. And of course, I'm freaking out, like not expecting to go to a hackathon on a random Friday. Um, you know, it was, it was very, very last minute and knowing that it was my job interview for like a huge company like JP Morgan, like it was, it was intimidating. Um, but you know, I went, tried my best, made so many new friends. I actually am going to be seeing, uh, one of them today. He's, uh, he came into uh, the Dallas area from Houston to do an event. So we're going to catch up today. We worked together in the hackathon. Um, and you know, we worked together, met a lot of really great employees as well from the company and. I guess through our performance overall, as well as the contributions that I made to the team, you know, it gave me the opportunity to work for them over the summer as a software engineering intern. 
And there I worked in the infrastructure platforms division. So rather than catering towards a specific group or a particular like financial entity, our client was JP Morgan themselves. Uh, my team specifically was in charge of everything related to uh, Kafka, which is a streaming service uh, or a streaming platform, excuse me, uh, that allows, you know, uh, seamless event streaming and management um, amongst different microservices. And, you know, this is a huge, huge um, thing. It was originally created by LinkedIn and then became open source through the Apache license. And now it's used like everywhere, Spotify, Netflix, other just huge companies in general, they, they almost all of them use Kafka. And so my team and I, we were the ones who, you know, worked on making sure that Kafka worked, you know, getting Kafka set up with AWS and, you know, other private and public cloud um, solutions. And I specifically got to work on um, the private cloud side of um, Kafka and creating a GraphQL endpoint that could like query um, like Kafka metadata in real time for all of our um, private data, uh, for all of our private cloud stuff. And I think it's going to be pushed into production relatively soon. I know we got it up to the UAT level, but uh, right before we could push it up to production, um, I had to leave it as it was the end of the internship, but it was a really great experience that I learned. Yeah, that's cool. I just had a, yeah, cool. a side question based on that. Do you have any advice for like sure. the people who are like listening, like how, like how to like, get the best like experience from your internship, for example, like meet new people, like get the best, like get a better like network, gain more skills, like anything like that any advice on like what like what to do when you're in when you're in your uh, internship? You know, I think for me, my philosophy really just is a job is a job, right? And you've got to be able to know when to just let things go, right? You know, I knew a couple people who took the internship so seriously and were working on stuff until midnight, like every night, and then Going, getting back at it at eight in the morning every day. Um, I still don't understand why, let alone how they did that, but that's what they did. And, you know, it, it's just an internship, but I mean, it, it, you're basically working as an entry level software engineer and that's, you know, a job. So being able to understand, you know, you have how to have a work-life balance to make sure that you're not killing yourself in the job, but also, you know, making sure that you, you know, go out there and try to talk to as many people as you can and learn from as many people as you can. You know, I think that's what really gives you a great experience. Uh, when I was at JP Morgan, they encouraged what they called coffee chats, which is where you set up like a 15 to 30 minute little talk with, you know, higher ups or your fellow peers to discuss, you know, the program or, you know, who each, uh, like who you are, who they are, like how things work in the, in the firm and like just talking about their experiences. And I probably did like two or three a week. You know, um, it totally wasn't a way for me to get out of doing my work every now and again. Um, <laughs> but it was also just like a way that it really improved my like experience at the, at the firm. And it really taught me so much. And I think just that alone contributed so much to my professional development. And if you have the opportunity to work at a big company or a small company, take the time to know who you're with, know your product and just enjoy it as much as you can. And don't forget to have fun. That, that's that's really good advice. Um, now I want to ask about like what made you choose UTG over like other colleges. That, that was one of the sure. Uh, so one of the biggest ones really is just that I'm local to the area. Um, I remember for me really, um, I was kind of in a bit of a funky spot. Um, I graduated right after the breakdown. Uh, I was class of 2021, and so I because of like a bunch of random logistics things i couldn't even take the sits the every single time i tried to take the exam it got um canceled because of COVID. i think i tried taking it like five times um and so i knew that like bigger universities was kind of out of the question um i did apply to you know most of the big colleges in the texas area so like utd um a m ut baylor probably missing a few other ones oh and, and i also applied to the university of arkansas and i ended up getting into everyone except for ut austin um, and so, you know, when I was like weighing on my options, I understood that, you know, it's a great program. I think they have one of like the, like top 50 or something in, in the nation or something. I, I honestly can't remember the statistic off the top of my head, but you know, there's a lot of really great, um, outreach that's done for computer science. We even have a designated computer science outreach center. 
Um, there's also a program where you can, you know, get your master's and your undergraduate in four years. I'm not participating in that program, but I know plenty of other people who are. And, you know, it's a really good research hub and there's so many big companies coming to the Dallas area. And plus I can save a little bit of money staying with my parents that uh, I understood that that's kind of what made it the best choice. And um, I guess I've been here now and I'm on my third year of school and you know, it's definitely a very um, antisocial place. There's a lot of jokes that the culture of UTD is that we don't have a culture. But, you know, I've been able to put myself out there and, you know, I still met so many great people and I've been able to just have fun and have a college experience, even though, you know, it's you're kind of expected not to. It's just, you know, your ability to put yourself out there and make sure that, you know, you can have a good time in the environment that you're Interesting. Um, for, so you talk about, like, how to manage, like, work-life balance. I want to ask, like, how do you manage your work-life balance, your school life, and your social life with, like, friends and family? Ooh. Uh, so, one of the biggest things is boundaries. So, what I mean by that is, you know, making it incredibly clear that you are going to dedicate this time to this particular thing and making sure that everyone is aware of that, right? So, for me, um, my schedule is really hectic this semester. Um, I work full days, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. I work in the morning, Tuesdays and Thursdays, and then I'm in school at night. And I make sure to leave those nights for myself, uh, like when I'm working for myself, to do homework, to spend time with my friends and family. And the weekend is really when I like to catch up on work and then spend the rest of the time with my friends and family. And, you know, being able to kind of make it clear with, you know, the managers that I work with, like, hey, I'm in school too. School is my number one priority. I can't continue to work with you guys if I'm not going to be in school, right? And I need to be able to put school um, like there at that top position. And they were very, very understanding of that. And it's given me a real lot of flexibility. And then also just, you know, using a lot of really great tools. Um, I know Notion is really popular. I've tried. I'm not that artsy. Um, I am more of a Google Calendar guy. I live by my Google Calendar. Um, everything that I have is on there and I swear by it. And yeah, so shout out Google, I guess. Um, so yeah, just being able to have that kind of a tool to help with your time management, establishing the boundaries with the people that you're with, if you're in like any clubs, that as well to make sure that, you know, the people that you're working with have realistic expectations of yourself. And just also ensuring that you give yourself some time to properly take care of yourself and, you know, not burn out. So like for me, I try to, you know, stay a little bit active, go to the gym whenever I can or you know, play music and stuff like that to me is um, how I take care of myself. And I think all of those things combined is kind of how I'm able to get some sort of a work life balance. Cool. If you will. Uh, cool. My next question I want to ask, like, what led you to, you know, like pursue a degree in computer science? Like what made you interested in like going into computer science in particular? And yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it all began probably when I was in the seventh or eighth grade, something like that. I was in middle school and Capital One hosted an after school program where they came and they taught you like um, very basic coding. It was like one of those programming languages where you like have little puzzle blocks that you piece together. And they came and they taught us everything and I did okay in the program. I think um, I made like a little app where it was like a tiny little piano you could play. And I had a really fun time and I learned a lot. And so after that, I had to sign up for classes for, you know, what I was going to take when I was in high school. And my dad kind of forced me to take my first real computer science class because he knew I had so much fun in the program. And I was like, are you sure? I was really reluctant. And he was absolutely positive and I did. And I just had such a great teacher and having that, you know, great teacher or professor or influence that could push you into the right direction, in my opinion, is just so so important i feel like almost everyone i know who's in this degree with me have that same person and for me it's uh, my old ninth grade um, ap computer science principles teacher who you know was that influence to really push me in the right direction and hearing about her experiences in industry that's kind of um, in my experience in her class was like okay this is what i want to do uh, then i took you know more and more higher level computer science classes when i was in high school um, I got to work on a little project where I got to make like a tiny little tool for my old algebra teacher so that she could like manage all of the calculators, like the, the TI-84 graphing calculators they needed to get checked up to students who can't afford them. And getting to see how you can use tech to help other people, that was kind of what cemented that like, yes, this is what I want to do. 
And, you know, now I'm in the program, I'm graduating in May and I've been able to just do so much. And, you know, it, I, I think I've made the right decision and all those factors were what really pushed me into it. And I just have like a side question. So when you, when you, since you're about to like, like finish your degree off, when you look back at your like journey throughout like middle school, high school, even college, do you see something that like you could have done like better or like something that really you look at that, like that changed me or like some kind of like big defining moment in your like opinion? Oh, dude, I have so many. <laughs> I mean, you know, when you're in high school, college, even middle school, you know, you're going to have so many moments of self-exploration and self-discovery, you know, like, um, I, I mean, in terms of like, you know, professional development, I think for me that the biggest one was when I was taking, you know, that first upper level sci uh, computer science class, right? Um, I, you know, had, I didn't have the best teacher and I was just kind of sitting there so stumped, like, cause before it was all so intuitive and, you know, and then I had to like, um, and we were assigned this cumulative project. And so I sat down after Thanksgiving break and, you know, taught myself like the entire curriculum and taught myself coding from scratch. And I made so much progress. And that was kind of like the aha moment where I knew that that was for me. Um, and, you know, that for me was kind of like what cemented it. But I think in terms of like, if there was one thing that I could do different, you know, I really do think, especially in this past year, making sure that I have a lot of, like making sure that I don't burn myself out and trying to find a job and, and all that. Because, you know, there's this whole like preconceived notion about like the internship grind. And there's a lot of jokes out there when you're in college, like, oh yeah, I need to work my butt off so I can get a job at Amazon and prove that I'm better than everyone else. And I hate to say it, but I did kind of fall into that, um, into that category for a little while where I was just obsessed with it. And I burned myself out to the point where like, I was getting so anxious at the thought of a job interview. Right. And I mean, sure. It, it ended up working out. I got a great job at a huge corporation and like, I learned so much, but you know, at the same time, like that whole struggle that I put myself through and, you know, being so hard on myself and not giving myself any break or cutting myself any slack. Like, I think that, you know, did so much more harm than good. And if I could do it again, I would probably just tell myself to like, trust the process, relax and have a little bit of fun. And I'm sure that if I would have done that, I still would have ended up in the same place that I was at. But, you know, at the same time, I'd like to think that anything, uh, that everything happens in your life for a reason. So if there's something that's hard going on in your life, just know that you'll reach the other side and you'll know that there's something that you'll learn from it because of like, because of it going down. That's, that's good. That's, that's good reflection right there. Um, I had like a, you know, like an interesting question related to like AI. So I know you're, you're in college and you know, you're coming into the, to the job market pretty soon for like, do you see like any way like AI is impacting you right now, like in your current like jobs or like your previous jobs, like where they're saying like for, the college students to like take AI courses or learn AI in particular or like any way like it's impacting you in like school itself. Right. Um, uh -huh. If it's all right with you, um, I'm going to talk about like yeah, school and work. Is, sure. is it all right with you? All right. Awesome. So with school, I would definitely have to say that AI is definitely affecting me. You know, I go into every single one of my classes now and every single one of my teachers make the joke, don't use chat GPT, we'll know. It's like, it's gonna be bad and you're not gonna learn anything. And um, it, it's definitely changed the way that, you know, I approach a lot of my problems now. Like prompt engineering is such an important skill. Like I had this one colleague who works for uh, Mary Kay and he told me that apparently the, the company requires that every single person who works there gets an account with chat GPT um, and uses it to like help um, you know, produce product, I mean, increased productivity. And apparently it was able to like increase it double fold. And to some extent I'm experiencing that same way within my studies. Cause now I have this like magical wizard or whatever that I can go to. And if I'm stuck in a problem and something really, really niche, I can kind of sort of pull a, you know, half baked answer that can put me in the right direction. And so for me, I, you know, I'm a big believer in using chat GPT and, you know, other large language models and, you know, hopefully in the future, large action models, um, to, you know, help you like it to help use it kind of as like a tool in your toolbox, kind of like if you're stuck on something, looking it up on Google. Um, and I think that's, I mean, that's kind of what I see it as. I don't necessarily think it should be used as any more beyond, uh, anything else besides that though. Like, so 
people to try to use it just to do all of your assignments. Like, you know, that, that's not good because you're not learning anything, right? Um, I, I think it's just a, it's such an important tool and it's um, definitely something that I think will help me out in that regard. But like as for work, you know, I definitely do agree that everyone should be taking something in terms of artificial intelligence, um, whether it be doing research like I did or, you know, sitting down and actually taking an AI class, which honestly is what I would recommend because doing everything self-taught led to just so many issues and so many problems that I'm still even facing now. But another thing that I want to talk about is the importance of data. Um, one thing that my um, research advisor, Dr. Tan, would always tell me is you can't have a good model without good data, right? And that goes in any single way you could think about it. And, you know, you can't have a good model if, it, if the data isn't good. But also, you've got to make sure that that data that is coming into your system is going to be able to go there quickly, is able to get there efficiently, will be secure and all that. And working in a streaming um, service like or in a streaming platform like Kafka, um, understanding that, you know, our system that we have in place can be then used to help train these AI models and, you know, make sure that this data it can be sent seamlessly over in large amounts. That's also so important. And while AI is really big, uh, data will forever be this, you know, giant thing that we also need to, you know, be aware of. And I think if we also put a lot of importance towards like making sure that like network infrastructure and stuff like that, you know, there's a lot of attention put onto that as well. I, I mean, I think that's, you know, just so important. I mean, if, if I could give you some advice, I think AI with a mix of just like understanding how things work in terms of like networking and setting up all those pipelines and stuff, that's, that's just going to help you out. That's, so much more. That's I just had like a question that's, related to like, you know, getting your sure. first like job into college or even like, high school related to your specific like field like would do you have any advice for like how someone could get that first job because like i know that nowadays like getting that first job is really difficult with, like increased competition and everything like people are trying really hard so like, mm -hmm. any advice like how to solidify and get that first job and build up the experience yeah yeah absolutely i mean i think the biggest thing really is just putting yourself out there, right? Um, no one is going to help you if no one knows who you are. If you're just some other name, even if you have like a perfect GPA and all of these like amazing self, like self projects, if those like projects that are out there, like, you know, they might sound cool. And, you know, sometimes for big companies like that, that will really help you out. But like if they don't see that, you know, you're trying to put interest in with them, that's only going to, you're only shooting yourself in the foot. You know, for me, what really helped was by taking this course through the university called Epics, which is Engineering Projects and Community Service. And, you know, through that project, through that class, I was assigned a, a cumulative project over the course of the semester where I worked with a group of students on solving an engineering problem with a nonprofit. And I was specifically got to start working with uh, Dr. Carolyn Garver and uh, the Autism Treatment Center of Dallas. And through that experience, I learned so much. I learned about like embedded systems programming, which I also learned is not for me. Um, but, you know, through that, I made so many great connections and, you know, that was what helped me get my first job because then that got me into a firm that did contracting and consulting and embedded systems engineering. Um, and so being able to like put yourself out there, but not like, you know, you just randomly hop up to people on like, you know, LinkedIn or whatever and be like, Hey, you work at Netflix, get me a job, please. Like, like not that, but, you know, ensuring that, you know, you can have real like human interaction with other people can just help you so much. And, you know, kind of like what the experience that I had with like Diana too, just like, you know, making sure that you're nice to everyone, keeping as much of a positive attitude as you can and just ensuring that you're talking to other people and taking, making, uh, putting yourself out there can really help. You know, if you're trying to find a job at like a bigger company, reaching out to recruiters, being proactive with them can be so, so helpful. And, you know, also just making sure that you're just trying your best and being as genuine about it, I think is just so important. And I think all those things can really help you land your first job. And with that first job, it's okay if it's not a giant company. I was my first job like in industry. I was maybe one of four or five employees. It was a very, very small little place. And I still learned so much and I still, you know, I mean, it, it was difficult. There were a lot of difficulties and challenges that were presented, especially in a small firm like that, but I made the most of it. 
and taught myself a lot through that program. And, you know, here we are about two years later. And, you know, now I have these two big companies under my belt and, you know, I'm forever grateful for it. And it's because of that experience I had with that first job. So, you know, we all start from somewhere and you've got to You talked about like building your your network. Like, could you like give some advice on like how high school students or even college students could help like build their network? Like how to, because I know like it's like kind of a challenge because like in, in like schools, they don't like focus much about like building your network, especially in high school. Like, do you have any advice like how we like we could start young and like build our network more like like grow our network so when we get to that point where we need like a job that we could like reach out to our network and you know like find something sure sure i and i mean you know to begin i just want to say that like when it comes to your network it, it i really see it not so much as like oh this mm-hmm. is a way for me to potentially get a job in the future it's more of just people with similar interests, similar goals and stuff that you can learn from and that you can talk to. And, you know, for me, what that meant was, you know, when I was in high school, you know, I, um, you know, I was in a kind of different situation with being in high school during COVID and then starting my freshman year as well with a lot of COVID restrictions. It made things a, um, a lot more difficult, but, you know, I think, just remembering that in your surroundings, if you look hard enough, you're going to find someone interesting. Um, like for me, what I did when I used to work at that rec center, I used to work at the uh, front desk and I would always like, you know, you know, whenever you're setting up the account with them, you'd always do some sort of small talk. And, you know, like sometimes I was like, Oh, you guys go to the area. Oh, that's so cool. What, are you, did you move here for a job or like what you move here for? Oh, what do you do? And from there that can, you can kind of like, get the conversation going to learn more about them and what they do. And that's when you can say, Oh, really? I work in, I, I really want to like study this or oh, I want to work in this. And if there's one thing people love to talk about, it's themselves. So if you can kind of like kind of bring the direction of the conversation towards, Hey, what do you do? And this is something that I'm really interested in. Let's talk about that. It, it, it helps so much. And I made so many great connections at some really big companies. Um, well, in fact, one of the um, I met this one uh, engineer who he was like a senior engineer for TI, and he was telling me so much about his experience and like said, "Hey, if you want to find a good job, learn about Docker and Kubernetes, and learn about like how the deployment stuff works." And I had no idea that any of that stuff even existed when I was a senior in high school, but it helped me out tremendously. And you know, understanding that you know a person is a person and not just a means to an end, being able to just have that open communication with anyone, and then. If, you know, the conversation can go smoothly, maybe trying to like talk a little more about that can be really helpful. But again, just like remember that these people can, you know, other people too, and that doesn't negate them from being your friends, right? So just, you know, make sure that, you know, when you're talking to people, just be nice, be positive, try to put yourself out there and talk to as many people as you can, learn as much as you can and, you know, treat these people in your network really just as like, you know, potentially like friends or people that you can learn from and grow from or grow with together. Mm-hmm. I guess that's my little two cents. I apologize if that was a bit of a tangent there. That was good advice because, you know, like for us, like we really, like, you know, it's kind of difficult because they don't teach it that much. I have one last question. Uh, is when do you, when you like, for like people are like listening who want to like go into a college like UTD, or like, and as you know, like the, the college admission space is getting really, really competitive nowadays. Like people are doing crazy stuff to like, get into college. Do you see any way like the high school students can, like position themselves to be into a good college while still gaining like good experience and like doing things that they enjoy rather and still be competitive? Like, do you see anything that could be uh, something like that? Cause you, like, you recently like gone to college like a few years ago, so. Sure. Sure. I mean, I think for me, I mean, I'm not, (laughs) to be totally honest, I might not be the best person to give advice, but on this particular topic, but I'll try my best. Um, I think that if you, you know, try your best in school and if you really put your heart into something, whether that be a club or a hobby or something, and you put your all into it, I think that speaks mountains more than that guy that did everything and who did all this crazy stuff, like, but did so much of it. Right. Like, man, I guess kind of going back to that other question of like, you know, if I could have done something different in high school, like I, 
I remember uh, for a project I had to like, it was like a creativity project or something. You had to like collaborate with another person and make something. So I ended up making like a little um, electric dance music um, sort of duo thing with a friend and we made a couple of bad songs. And I think if, you know, we continue to like, you know, push ourselves and keep going down that track, that could have been something just so great. And with that, Right. In terms of your college application, that could be like such a cool, you know, essay to talk about how like you, you know, started something with your friend and it grew into this really big thing. And I think if you can just throw yourself into your two, like one or two of your like favorite things in the world um, and, you know, as well as you're trying your best in school and not so much like, oh, I need to get straight A's in every single class. But like, mm-hmm. you know, if you get a B or a C every now and again, that's fine. It's not going to kill you. But just like trying your best and remembering that it's all going to work out in the end and, you know, just being humble and genuine in your essays as well. And just, uh, you know, making sure that, you know, you seem like the kind of person who's willing to commit themselves um, towards, you know, a particular goal and being able to like achieve something with it. I think that might be the biggest thing that can help you. But again, um, I don't fully know how the college admission systems works. It's just, if I was the one making the decisions, I think that's, what the criteria that I would like want to follow for making those decisions for who I'd want to let into my hypothetical universe. That's, that's good advice. I, I don't want to thank you for your, for your time. You had some great advice for like the high school students out there listening. I want to thank you again. That's it for today's podcast. Again, if you enjoyed this episode, make sure to follow us on wherever you get your podcast. And if you'd like to support us even more, make sure to rate us wherever you get your podcast. Until then, we look forward to seeing you in a future podcast very, very soon.